When Kuros last did battle with the evil wizard Malkil atop Icefire Mountain, he raised his iron sword in triumph and glory. Or so he thought. Suddenly, a powerful bolt of magic has robbed Kuros of his armor, memory, and honor. But the distant presence of evil stirs in his mind, leading him to the once fair city of Pydup, the very same place where the villainous soul of Malkil survives. Without his armor, Kuros will need crafty disguises to travel undetected, ready to do battle as a wizard, nobleman, or thief. His quest will take him from the depths of the dungeon to the palace containing riches beyond belief, building strength, perfecting fighting skills, and acquiring rare knowledge of magic along the way. The time has come for Kuros to turn his visions of power into reality. In Wizards and Warriors 3, Kuros, Visions of Power from Acclaim and Rare in 1992. Oh, the third and final game in the Wizards and Warriors trilogy it was developed by Zippo Games for Rare, much like the last one, published by Acclaim. It's the third and final installment and is the sequel to the 1989 Iron Sword. The game picks up immediately after the events of Iron Sword, where the night warrior Kuros had just defeated Malkil on the peak of Icefire Mountain. Unaware that Malkil's spirit is still intact, Kuros gets struck by a bolt of magic from the spirit, causing him to lose his armor, memory, and honor. Yeah. Malkil flees to the city of Pydup and seizes the throne from the good King James. Meanwhile, Kuros, after wandering in months, four months in the wilderness without weapons, armor, or food, arrives in the same city where he must build strength and utilize various skills and disguises in order to take on Malkil. The game is very non-linear and requires us to explore various areas and pick up items and gain abilities to unlock different parts of the city in order to progress. Wizards of More Years 3 was developed by Stay and John Pickford, who also had a few additional programmers and artists to assist them. Um, they designed the game as an homage to Ultimate Play the Games, 1983 Spectrum, uh, Attic Attic, A-T-I-C, A-T-A-C. They drew inspiration for gameplay and art from other NES games such as Metroid, Faxanadu, and Super Mario Bros. 3. The game had moderate sales, though not as good as, as Iron Sword. It was praised for its bold graphics, expansive gameplay, and challenge. However, it was mostly criticized for its controls, lack of fighting, and the lack of continues or passwords. While the game did receive mixed reviews, Stay Pickford said that the game was a personal favorite. Zippo Games, which was acquired by Rare and was known as Rare Manchester during development, shut down shortly before this game's completion. And while the game hinted at another sequel, it never occurred. This is my least favorite of the games. Um, basically for the reasons that were listed uh, here. The game... Well... This is, this is basically, in the Wizards and Warriors universe, this is Mario is missing. It's got all the same characters, things work kind of the same, but the game is not a Wizards and Warriors game, in my opinion. First of all, the non-linear version, or style of the game really makes it difficult to know where to go and what to do and you will spend a lot of time if you have never played this game before just wandering around trying to figure out what the hell it is you're trying to do adding a class system was an interesting idea um we have to basically become a level three knight a level three thief and a level three wizard and to do that we have to visit corresponding guilds for each of these classes. We have to go through a little test, which is either a horizontal or vertically scrolling level with a boss at the end, and then the uh, person who runs the guild basically gives us a reward. We get a new outfit and a new ability. Um, uh, I, it's, it's an interesting idea. It just feels like it just kind of falls short. Um, I don't know. There was preview coverage in the 1991 issue of Nintendo Power. There, the magazine praised the graphics as being eye grabbers, saying that Rare has a knack for bold, colorful gra graphics, excuse me, uh, which is true, but the graphics to me almost look too cartoony. 
They also lauded the game's expansiveness and challenge. However, a couple of months later, they announced that the game's release was delayed. The game would eventually receive a rating in its George and Rob's Now Playing um, in the April 92 issue, quite a bit later, but it did not receive a review. Sold 30,000 copies in North America and 300,000 in Europe, according to company figures. It was featured in February 1992's Game Pro magazine. Their reviewer Slasher Quan compared the controls to the previous Wizards and Warriors titles, saying that Kuros is hard to control in certain instances, but it's still razor sharp. His criticism of the game included frustrating item tracking due to the game's non-linear structure, lack of fighting, and lack of continues or passwords. He added that with regard to the lack of continues or password, that this is particularly a shame because Acclaim reports this baby's about twice as long as Iron Sword. Overall, he said that Wizards of Warriors 3 was slightly blurry compared to its predecessors. And, you know, I'm going to have to agree with that. It got a 3 out of 5 from all game. GamePro gave it um, a 4, a 3, a 3, a 3, excuse me, two fours, two threes, and a 5 out of 5 in separate ra uh, reviews, reviews or ratings, whatever. Nintendo Power gave it a 3-1, a 3, a 3-1, and a 3-1 out of 5 on its panel. Honestly, if you liked the first game, awesome. If you liked the second game, great. If you liked the third game, fantastic. Wizards and Warriors, to me, is one of those series that it started really strong. And then it just kind of tapered off into nothing. Which is too bad. you <laughs>